Before I get started with the directions and introductions, uh, you will notice that whenever you logged in, there was a poll um, and it prompted you to answer those questions. Um, that information, just so you know, is um, anonymous. Uh, we only use the numbers of how many people answered what question. So no personal information or names or anything is associated with that data, just in case you were wondering and prefer not to answer is a perfectly acceptable um, answer to those questions. Um, okay, so during the program, please stay muted the whole time and do not share any video. If you have any technical questions or problems with your viewing of the program, please refer those to the chat box or you can email me. All that information is in the chat box right now. I copy and pasted a little blurb into there that you can read. It has my email in it. Um, and as usual, this program is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, at a later date. Uh, I'll send out an email after this program with that information um, after the program today. So our presenter today is Austin Little. Austin is a University of Illinois Extension horticulture educator. He covers Jackson, Franklin, Williams, and Randolph in Perry counties in southern Illinois. Um, with that, I will go ahead and let Austin take it away. Thank you for that introduction, Maggie, and hello everybody and uh, welcome you today to our webinar on Vermicomposting 101. So originally I was thinking of calling this what in the worm vermicomposting but we went with a simpler term but uh, I'll use it for next time and so today we are going to look at here's our outline here of vermicomposting basics so today we're going to take a closer look at vermicomposting and worm farming in the home so raising worms at home. And we'll look at a bit of worm biology and why vermicomposting or vermicompost is known as black gold. We'll also look at the methods of keeping worms at home and building a vermicompost bin. And we'll uh, then look at some uses of vermicompost. So how we can use that in our gardens and in our uh, containers and in our, our gardening projects. And so this should take around an hour and then we'll have some time for questions after that. And as Maggie said, you can pop those questions into the chat box as we go along. So first we need to quickly do a review of what soil is and how vermicompost is an important component of soil and organic matter. So soil is the interface or the environment where all of these biological and digesting of organic matter and recycling materials. So recycling plant materials and, and once living animal, animal materials. So all these processes are taking place in the soil. And so soil is comprised of, a min of mineral particles, organic matter, living things, gas and liquid. And if you'd like to learn more about soils, I've recently done a webinar on uh, soils, uh, so just basic intro to soils in the Beginning Gardener webinar, and uh, that can be found on our unit uh, web, or unit YouTube page, which uh, I think we have a link for, but if not, uh, we'll, 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 get, we'll get a link for you for that. So vermicompost plays a role and has a part in, in, this, uh, in this greater kind of mixture of, of pieces in soil. And soil is generally uh, mostly air and uh, liquid. And the organic part of that is, is the smallest component, but that vermicompost is, is part of a healthy soil. And uh, we'll talk here a little bit more about organic matter. So basically soil organic matter is comprised of once living materials that are being broken down and processed by soil organisms and one of these is worms, but uh, the microorganisms that are going to play a big part of this are bac bacteria, fungi, nematodes, other, uh, other little microorganisms. And so these organisms use soil organic matter as a food source and an energy source. So e and and uh, they, uh, they uh, uh, acquire their, their uh, food and energy from organic matter and um, by consuming uh, this uh, decaying material or by consuming other, uh, other microorganisms as well. 
Now, either when, uh, when this uh, material is digested and excreted or, and or when these microorganisms die, they release these nutrients and materials. And uh, the final stage of organic matter is humus. And humus is, is, there's a few different stages of humus itself, but broadly, humus is the final and most stable form of organic matter uh, after all of this decomposition. So uh, humus is, a, is an interesting material in that it, it uh, kind of is like a glue. It holds, so it, it creates soil structure, creates uh, air and uh, water porosity. It, it gives soils that dark, rich color and uh, contributes to structure, soil condition, and cation exchange capacity. So vermicompost and the, the uh, digestion that worms use to process material, some of that becomes humus. Uh, so worm castings are uh, 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 vermicompost, worm castings, same thing, have a high percentage of humus. That's what we're, that's the, that's the resulting product is this, uh, it's pure, purely organic matter with a lot of really great, highly nutritive and uh, highly valuable uh, enzymes and materials in, in the vermicompost. So let's look closely here at what exactly vermicompost is. So vermiculture, that's what we're talking about today, vermicomposting. Vermiculture is the practice of raising worms specifically under controlled conditions. And so vermicompost is the product that, that we're getting out of vermiculture or vermicomposting. Uh, we can say vermiculture and vermicomposting are the same thing, same practice. Uh, so what we're getting is a mixture of partially decomposed organic waste, humus, bedding, worm castings. Now worm castings are their waste and uh, dead worms are uh, gonna be in there as part of the natural life cycle. Worm cocoons, so uh, what's a worm cocoon? That is their eggs. So worms hatch from small little uh, brown to yellowish kind of eggs. So some of the eggs are in there, some of the cocoons and uh, other organisms. So uh, vermicompost contains a lot of other microorganisms and uh, they, they're, they're in a symbiotic relationship with worms. So worms by themselves, can't digest the organic material that they're eating as food in, in, the, in the soil or, the net or their net wild environment, just like people. Uh, we have to have, you know, just like any other kind of uh, organism with a digestive system, we rely on microorganisms in our systems and so do the worms to help us uh, break those things down and um, to digest and absorb nutrients. And uh, those microorganisms are going to play a part in the soil, but also in the guts of the uh, of our worms. And so, this vermicompost that we uh, that we end up with is is highly concentrated organic matter. Uh, again, it's it contains all these beneficial microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, nutrients, and enzymes. So, enzymes are things like their uh, compounds and, and uh, these things, a lot of it is uh, plant uh, growth regulators or plant hormones. So cellulose, amylase, uh, proteases, these urease, uh, these are just enzymes that have a critical role in uh, soil health and, um, and uh, as, a, um, as a plant growth regulator. So, So the, uh, the, let's look at the nutrient content of vermicompost. What's in vermicompost? Uh, nutrient content, content varies pretty widely depending on how concentrated it is, depending on the food source, you know, depending on how long uh, the, the uh, worms have been composting and a couple other factors. Uh, climate temperature has a role there, but uh, the general overall uh, analysis uh, of uh, vermicompost. So the analysis here we're talking about these this number 333 uh, that stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And uh, again um, if you'd like to check out uh, some previous videos I've done I go a lot more into detail on plant health and plant nutrients. So we talk a lot more about that in uh, the beginning gardener series that I'd recommend you check out. 
Uh, and so vermicompost tends to be higher in nitrates, which is good because plants, especially garden uh, plants like uh, the produce uh, annuals that we, that we grow, like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, these kind of things prefer nitrates. Uh, they're easier to take up and easier to assimilate into the plant. So it's higher in nitrates and um, lower in, in, uh, in ammonium and um, other uh, forms of nitrogen. So, so we got 333. Three, three. And now that seems like maybe not a high number, but the thing to remember here about vermicompost, one of the important aspects of this is it's not necessarily about that analysis. It's also what we're, what we're benefiting from here, what we're receiving as a, as a service from this is the, the heavy concentration of these plant growth, plant growth regulators or these plant uh, hormones and these enzymes. These enzymes and hormones and the beneficial microbes included are this, are this uh, uh, complete package of, uh, of uh, substances and, and, and nutrients that really help to boost the soil health, which by extension uh, makes healthier, uh, more productive plants. And with these micronutrients and fungi, what they're doing in the soil is they are, again, digesting organic matter and converting unavailable nutrients, converting forms of unavailable nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in the soil over to uh, uh, available forms, available uh, uh, chemical forms of these, of these nutrients in the soil, which are then available, more plant available, available to the roots. So while the direct nutrient load here maybe doesn't seem that high, what, what this material, this vermicompost is doing is unlocking otherwise unavailable nutrients in the soil on top of that. So, so this is kind of the soil science part of it where we're building a soil food web that's, that's uh, providing you know, uh, a more, uh, more available nutrients. And again, we mentioned that uh, worms uh, use bacteria in their guts to process food. Uh, so yeah, it's gonna be rich in these microbes that they, uh, that they release through their waste uh, and uh, other beneficial microbes and enzymes. Also, worms produce a mucus. So if you've ever uh, held a worm, you've ever you know, gone fishing and, and handled worms, then you know that they're a bit slimy. So they do produce this mucus that helps uh, hold soil particles together, which, uh, which helps soil hold on to nutrients and water for longer to make it more plant available. And so why would we want to start vermicomposting? So I kind of mentioned some of the benefits here, but you know, long-term soil fertility. So we're getting better plant health with better yields. Again, soil structure, we, we mentioned that already, but just to reiterate, we're improving our soil structure and that makes better use of water and nutrients. And we're building a desirable microorganism community that uh, is gonna thrive and uh, be, uh, uh, that's gonna thrive in vermicompost. And again, helping to, uh, create this more robust, more biodiverse soil environment. We're reducing incidence of pests and disease um, because uh, the biodiversity is key there to, uh, to help uh, make healthier plants, to help our plants be uh, healthier, more robust, more vigorous, uh, and reduce uh, pest and disease pressure, and to help them be resistant to environmental stresses. So, uh, the, the more robust a root system is and the more healthy the plant is, the more it will be able to withstand some, some uh, environmental stresses like heat stress, you know, water stress, uh, maybe some damage to their, to their above ground structures and, and these kind of things. So overall, it's, it's uh, helping us to boost the health of our plants and our soil at the same time. And let's talk a little bit about earthworm biology here so we have a better idea of what these how these organisms behave in the environment and their, their morphology or kind of how their bodies work. So earthworms found in the backyard, like uh, night crawlers or kind of the common earthworm, uh, these aren't gonna be suitable uh, to a closed system that, that we're gonna 
intentionally be using worms to produce food in. Uh, they don't process food uh, and process waste as quickly as uh, some of the species that we'll talk about. They also don't do well in confined spaces. Uh, they're more suited for kind of um, outdoor soil where they have a wider range. So instead, uh, the recommended worms to use are commonly called red wrigglers or red worms. And red wrigglers are preferable. Uh, they're, they're probably the most commonly used species. Um, and there's a few different red wriggler species, and these are Icinia fetida and Icinia andrei. So those are the recommended. Those are probably the most available uh, commercially as well, but there are, again, um, also uh, red, uh, red worms um, are also used. So, and, you know, sometimes people will use mixes of, of a couple different species, which is, which is, um, uh, acceptable, you know, it's it's um, it's not going to be detrimental to the to the vermicomposting process. Um, so it's it's something you can do with some success. Uh, so sometimes if you have a a, a, a deeper um, container, then you know there's species that may go deeper into the into the bedding. Whereas you have some that maybe are more active in the higher in the in the higher uh, uh, layers, so maybe they're a little bit more shallow or bur bur burrowing, and then you have something that's deeper. But in general, you can just have one species, and it's probably cheaper to order just one species. Uh, but you can mix them. Uh, the only other thing is, you know, the since they are different species, they they don't hybridize, so they're not going to inter uh, interbreed. And you're not going to end up with like a mutant worm, but they, while they're not directly competing for resources, there should be enough resources for them all. Depending on like slight changes in temperature and weather conditions, if they're outside, one species may populate and reproduce more than the other, and it may cause the other to slow down. So by by that, you have an overall slowdown in production. So it's kind of your you're you're kind of um, making one species a bit redundant, but you know I, there there is writing out there, and I'm I'm by no means an expert on mixing um, mixing species, but uh, I I know that it's something that you can do, and and there are arguments for it. But uh, as a general kind of temperature range, most worm species are active between 55 and 85 degrees as long as they have adequate moisture. Okay, so uh, red wrigglers and red worms are hermaphrodites, so they have both male and female reproductive organs, but they still need two to reproduce. And in, in, uh, in good conditions, they can double their population every two weeks. And, um, it, or no, every two months, that should be every two months. They double their population every two months. That's, that was a typo there. And so uh, from four to six weeks from cocoon to emergence, so that's from egg to, uh, to juvenile, and then from six to eight weeks uh, from emergence to maturity. So it would be two months uh, to double. And so cocoons are about the size of a matchstick head, and they turn pearly white to brown as they develop until uh, one to several baby worms emerge. So out of one egg, a few can, uh, can uh, uh, emerge. And so this band here, I think, uh, uh, let me see if I have my pointer. Worms have a band known as the uh, clitellum, and that indicates uh, maturity, re reproductive maturity. So this would be the, I, I think this would be the clitellum here. It's kind of, kind of that bulge there in the body. So that indicates maturity, so, uh, uh, reproductive maturity. So about two months till they till they can double. Now the question is, well, what happens if my worms overpopulate? So that really shouldn't happen because because the bins we'll talk about today are a, are, are a self-limiting environment. So with, so the the resources in the space are going to dictate how much these, these uh, organisms 
reproduce. So they're going to reproduce to a certain point and then they're going to reach an equilibrium in their environment uh, where they should kind of stabilize. So, so you're going to have kind of a stable level of reproduction and, and, and death through their life cycle, um, ideally. So that's how, that's, that, that's how that should work. Okay, so let's talk about what worms eat. In the wild, earthworms are worms that we're going to find out in our backyard that we might go use for fishing. And red wrigglers alike feed on decaying organic matter and uh, small microorganisms and nematodes, these things like these. Um, and when they're above ground, they prefer decaying plant matter, but underground, they primarily eat when they're burrowing, they primarily eat algae, bacteria, and fungi. So what's happening is in the soil, they're technically eating soil, right? But you can think of soil as kind of the, uh, the tray or the delivery system that the food, that their food is coming on. So it's like the plate that they're eating off of. They're not really eating or, or absorbing the, the mineral and, and, uh, and that part of it. Um, what they're really consuming are the, are the, um, the organisms, those microorganisms, algae, bacteria, and fungi, and processing those into worm castings. So in a vermicomposting system, it's a little different. The worms can eat a wide variety of organic materials. So what we're feeding worms uh, is going to be a bit different, right? Um, now, over time, these uh, bacteria and fungi in the, in the bin, they will uh, reproduce as well. And so they'll be a part of, of their food source. But their major food sources are going to be kitchen waste. So uh, plant, any plant materials. And there are some limited yard waste that we can use. Um, so we'll look at a list here of, of uh, worm approved uh, foods or, or waste, we would call waste, to use in the vermicompost systems. Now things that we're just gonna say recommend against are any animal product, uh, dairy, animal byproducts, uh, you know, any kind of uh, bones or, or meat, uh, anything with, you know, anything like that, any kind of animal product or animal byproduct, we're going to uh, avoid, and uh, any kind of animal or pet waste as well. Wood chips, we, we, we recommend against wood chips. Some citrus fruits can irritate worms, so like pineapple and um, there's uh, like the peels of, uh, of like oranges can, can kind of be uh, a kind of a, a, an irritant to worms. Now they can, they can process some of it, but it's recommended to keep that as maybe a minimum. So maybe just a few peels at a time, something like that. And glossy paper. So something with like a, so when you look at a magazine that's got a glossy finish, that's usually like a clay kind of a, a clay um, a product that's used to make that glossiness. So they have a hard time digesting that. So that's, um, to be avoided as well. So here are some of our worm approved food sources. All fruits and vegetables, again, uh, citrus in limited quantities, coffee grounds, the coffee filters, you probably want to maybe rip up the filters a little bit, tea bags, um, grain, bread, crackers, cereal. Um, if it's moldy or stale, that's fine eggshells, uh, grass clippings, as long as, so grass clippings with the caveat that they have not been treated with pesticides or herbicides, um, because that's gonna still, that's gonna be persistent in the vermicompost. And it could be detriment, definitely pesticides could, you know, obviously pesticides are used to, to kill insects. Uh, they could be harmful to our worms, as could herbicides. So. Uh, so if, we, if you're using grass clippings, just try to make sure that they're not treated in any way. Uh, newspaper is going to be fine. Most inks are non-toxic nowadays. Uh, so shredded cardboard is fine. Uh, any kind of paper towels, you know, as long as they haven't been used with like cleaners or chemicals, uh, they're fine. And so like newspaper and cardboard, those are what we're going to use for uh, the bedding actually, and we'll talk about bedding here. 
Okay, now let's talk about how to construct a home vermicompost bin. And so the approach here is pretty simple. We need a container uh, with a lid and it needs to have ventilation. So it's got to have good ventilation so that the worms get air. They, they definitely need to have airflow uh, and, uh, and also to make sure it doesn't get too hot and to make sure that uh, moisture can evaporate out of there as well. So those are all important factors. And the, the bins come in many shapes and forms here. Uh, materials are pretty wide ranging, can be made out of plastic, wood, uh, not cedar though, because cedar has uh, micro antimicrobial uh, properties that can deter and, uh, and um, reduce the microbial population that we, that we actually want to promote. Styrofoam, if you can get styrofoam from like a seafood vendor, these are, these are seafood boxes or something that some kind of uh, meat or something was shipped in uh, with these holes drilled in there. Those are also really nice because they help insulate against temperature swings as well. So if you can get those, those are great. Any kind of, you know, you, know, you can even use something like a five gallon bucket as long as it's gonna be a smaller kind of operation there, but um, generally something in a box shape, I think would be the way to go. And uh, needs a lid so that you can close it. They need to be in a dark, and they, if they're exposed to light, they're gonna try to run away from the light. So we need to keep it dark. And, and the ventilation. Now, you know, some of these have spigots and drains on the bottom because liquid does drain to the bottom and that's gonna be vermicompost tea. So that's also gonna be a valuable product that, that uh, we can uh, save and use as a liquid fertilizer. And, um, you know, you have these uh, modular pre-made jobs here and so these have different levels, and I haven't used one of these, but I think the general kind of idea is that they process down through these levels, and then you end up with ready to harvest um, vermicompost. So it's kind of one of these things where uh, they try to streamline the process or make it uh, easier. But you know, with these things, you can you can do just as well by kind of doing the DIY. I think the DIY uh, approach. And if you can, it's recommended to keep them off the ground. So uh, we wanna try to keep our vermicompost uh, bins off the ground to help with aeration and um, kind of keeping them up on a raised kind of uh, platform, that is, that's what's recommended. So here we kind of see that it's raised off the ground or maybe put on some kind of, so, some kind of uh, structure where, where air, air flow can still get, get to the, uh, the uh, the bottom. Okay, so bedding. Let's look at bedding here. Uh, the materials need to have a high carbon to nitrogen ratio so that uh, it doesn't break down quick more quickly than the food materials that we're putting in there. So this is something. Uh, that we talk about in my composting class. And so the, the, so we're looking at brown material, what we would call brown materials, and these just have a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. And so uh, it's, uh, it's, gonna take, it's gonna take this material longer to break down than the food, the green, what we call green materials that have a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. So something more like 10 to one, you know, with our, with our food scraps, or our vegetable uh, scraps. And the idea is so that we're, we're promoting the organisms uh, and the worms to, to process the, the new green material and, and more slowly break down that brown material. It also uh, needs to, uh, the material also needs to be able to hold on to water uh, for, for some time uh, so that uh, we can keep that moisture level uh, in the, uh, in the in the um, the bedding, and so the bedding shouldn't be soaking wet. And really, once we wet the bedding down initially when we install it, uh, it shouldn't need a lot more moisture because a lot of that should be coming from the um, uh, the food, the, the the food materials that we're putting in there, and just from the digestion process create some some moisture. 
But uh, if, if we do need it, we can spray it with a, with a spray bottle to add a little bit more moisture. Uh, but uh, the bedding material itself should never be like sopping wet. It should be maybe, maybe if you squeeze it, you could squeeze out some moisture, but no more than that. And so the materials, the recommended materials is going to be shredded newspaper or cardboard about an inch thick is great. Um, as, 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 uh, additions or, or um, amendments, we can, we can add in some finished compost, uh, some cocoa core, peat moss. Um, and these things, these additions are really going to be to help hold water for longer. Um, like peat moss is going to be really good for holding on to water for a lot longer. So if you want a kind of a lower maintenance, less hands-on uh, vermicompost bin, uh, you're going to be looking at uh, peat moss to help hold water longer. So you may be, you know, if, you, if you've just got newspaper or something like that, you may need to keep a closer eye on it if you're going to leave for a couple days. But if you have peat moss in there, cocoa core, or some compost, that's going to help retain water for uh, significantly longer. And with that bedding, uh, the, the issue is, is that uh, you can't add too much bedding. This bedding is more like the inert, well, kind of the inert material that they live within um, where, they're, where they're burrowing and, and it's just kind of their, their environment that they're living in, while they also do consume it over, over time, um, slowly though. Uh, so you can't have too much of it, but you can have too little where they don't have enough. It's their, basically, you can think of it as, as their, their uh, house, you know, it's where they live. It can be too small. It can be too limiting. They don't have enough room to move around and reproduce and uh, light and, and go through their life cycle. Okay, so adding bedding, uh, just as kind of an arbitrary example here, if we have a 10 gallon bin, uh, you know, um, the size is, isn't really important. Um, composting worms live in like the top three inches of soil. Uh, so you don't need a huge bin to keep them in. Um, something like a Tupperware 10 gallon is just an example. Um, but if, say, again, going back to that idea of mixing, maybe you want something, you want to try to have something that's a deeper, deeper burrowing species and then a, and then a shallow burrowing species. In any case, uh, we want to pack our bedding material in there, um, you know, not, not smash down, but just kind of... Uh, make sure that we've got enough in there for them to move around in so that it's not too light and that it's not going to settle down into a, 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 a compacted, you know, smaller layer. So try to pack it in there lightly. And again, when we initially install the bedding, it's going to need to be wetted down. And um, you shouldn't, it should be wet enough to where we can maybe squeeze a drop or two uh, of, uh, of, of water out of there, but not more than, it shouldn't be sopping wet. And so again, peat moss is a, is a good addition to help hold some of that moisture. And it's also a good idea to mix in a handful or two of soil into our bedding mix. And this is going to inoculate or, you know, populate our, our soil with these microorganisms that are not only going to help break down the food so that it's so that worms are able to uh, actually consume it, but uh, these are also the microorganisms that the, the worms are consuming that are helping them to digest and uh, create vermicompost um, and, and decompose uh, the food sources. So worms don't really start eating on something till it's broken down into smaller pieces. And uh, the microorganisms help help with that uh, to an extent. And uh, the soil is also going, yeah, it's going to help with digestion. And okay, so purchasing worms, you know, um, you may be able to get red wrigglers at uh, like a re like a garden center or retail store, but uh, uh, commonly they're ordered online or you know through a catalog. And so they normally, uh, com it, the, the commercial uh, worm uh, um, delivery is usually, uh, they come in a cardboard box and uh, the kind of the standard size is one pound. 
which is roughly uh, 1,000 worms. And that's, you know, depending on where you order from and a species that's around $50 uh, more or less. And when you're ready to add your worms, uh, you just spread the entire contents of the box on the top of your bedding. Okay, so now we're moving on to adding food. When we feed our worms, we want to bury the pieces of food in the bedding, uh, three to four inches around that under the bedding. And we always wanna try to keep the food covered. So that's for a few reasons, you know, they like to stay in the, they like to burrow, right? They, they, they don't prefer to come out on the surface. Um, they like to stay uh, protected in their environment. And also covering the food is going to help prevent things like, uh, like uh, uh, fruit flies and gnats from becoming an issue. So if it's covered, those, those kind of uh, smaller, uh, annoying, annoying kind of insects won't be quite, quite an issue. So the general rate here that we're looking at is 1,000 or one pound of worms will generally eat about one half to one pound of food scraps each day. So that's about how much we need to be feeding. Uh, if, we, if we just started our bin and we have 1,000 worms, we can expect to put about a pound or two or a pound and a half of uh, kitchen scraps in there or whatever food we're, we're going to be feeding them each day. And so again, we want to we want to avoid overfeeding. Overfeeding our worms can cause some problems like um, buildups of acidity, odors, and uh, attract you know harmful bacteria into the into their environment. Uh, if we have too much rotting food getting getting too decomposed, yeah, we can start to get into some nasty kind of uh, conditions that are going to be harmful primarily for our worms. And we're going to have sick worms, or the whole you know the whole colony could fail, uh, which 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 will happen. You know, it's it's something that can happen for you know even the best laid plans. Uh, you can have your colony fail because of one thing or the other. So trying it's a it's kind of a balancing act here. But avoiding overfeeding is important, and um, it's underfeeding. You know, they'll slow down, but they'll they'll turn to their bedding and and uh, that kind of thing to feed on if they if they don't have enough um, fresh kind of green uh, uh, materials. So how do we know when it's time to harvest? That's a tricky question, and it's going to kind of be answered by multiple questions here. Uh, so as a general guide, four to six weeks of continuous feeding should produce enough castings to harvest, but depending on conditions, depending on the food types that we feed them, depending on the species, you know, uh, it, it just, it really depends, depending on the size of the, the bin, you know, depending on all of these factors. So it can take anywhere from six weeks to, uh, to two months before we have something enough to where we can harvest. But generally, we want to be looking for a uniform texture. Uh, we can see if the worms are slowing down, kind of, if they're not uh, actively digesting and, and breaking stuff down as quickly, or if the worms get smaller. So if they actually shrink in size, uh, that can tell us that it might be about time to harvest. They might be reaching uh, the limit of their bedding and their, and, uh, and, uh, their, their other kind of environmental restrictions. So also if, if it appears dark, so a finished vermicompost should appear dark and uh, brown or black. So if we're, if we're thinking we're getting to the point where, where we're close to ready to harvest, uh, we want to stop feeding for about two weeks. And so how do we physically harvest uh, the vermicompost here? So uh, one method is the dump and sort method. And so in this method, we're gonna lay down a heavy plastic sheet, or you know, you can even use newspaper like they're doing in the photo here. And we're gonna separate out our, our uh, uh, vermicompost into piles, into kind of conical, kind of cone-shaped piles. And uh, you need to do this outside in the light is ideal. Or we can, if you have like a high beam light, a high, uh, a high intensity light, you can shine it on the cone and that's going to encourage the, uh, 
the worms to go deeper into the middle of that cone. So then we can kind of, now this might, this is kind of a, a time consuming process here, but it is worth it. So then we're gonna move away the material uh, that doesn't have worms in it. And we're just gonna keep doing that until basically the worms are kind of in, the con in a concentrated grouping in the middle of that cone. And so what we end up with is, is mostly worms. There's still gonna be a little bit of vermicompost in there, but um, it's gonna be, you know, we're gonna get most of the vermicompost out of there. And so that's a time consuming process, but that's one way to do it. And uh, you don't need to worry about your worms running away because they're trying to stay within, you know, kind of stay within side of the, their protective kind of uh, covering from their, from their, comp their vermicompost. So then you can collect the worms, put them back into the system and add new, or add new bedding and then put them back into the system. Um, so that's one way. Then another easy way here is the divide and sort method where you don't uh, dump the worms out, you keep them within the container. But again, you would stop feeding for two weeks, move, move the, all of the old bedding and, and new compost basically to one side of the container. So you're gonna be moving all of the material over to one side. On the other side, add fresh bedding with food. And what will happen is the worms are gonna then migrate to the new bedding with the new food. And then you can go ahead and uh, take out the, the leftover vermicompost. You can also screen uh, if, you, if there's still some worms in there and you wanna hurry up the process. You can, you can use a system of mesh screens and shake out the compost, leave the worms, put them in the new bedding. Uh, you may have to do that a few times. You know, uh, when I've used vermicompost, so this is the home system, and this is what's recommended for small scale uh, vermicomposting. And, and I haven't tried either of these. What I've been familiar with is large scale vermicomposting. And it's a relative, you know, vermicomposting is a relatively new uh, process and uh, practice to me. I, I started using vermicompost in my graduate research in 2013. So that's when I really learned about vermicompost. And we had a vermicomposting uh, facility here at SIUC that I used in my research as a fertilizer. And so the system we used there is you basically make a row of food. You just put a row of food out, and you know this is mostly coffee grounds and uh, kitchen waste that's been chopped up into smaller bits uh, on a on a uh, on a tarp. You just lay this row of of food out on the tarp. You put your worms in at the at one end, and uh, you cover it with uh, with another tarp. And you know, make sure that it's uh, moist. You know, kept uh, wet enough. The the food kept wet enough, not dried out. And um, the worms just move down the line. It's kind of genius. The worms move down the line, and they leave behind the worm castings that you just go in and harvest and the vermicompost. And then they reach the end. You collect them and restart the process. So that's kind of a large. That's how they would do it in more of a high production. Uh, large-scale kind of vermicomposting process. And um, what we're doing here with this divide and sort, the reason I bring that up is you're doing kind of that same idea just on a smaller scale. Okay, so then storage. Let's talk about uh, storage. If we, if we can't use it right away, maybe it's winter time and, and we've got, we need to go ahead and harvest. Um, you can keep vermicompost in a, like a, just a five gallon bucket or a container. And that, and it's good for uh, up to three years. It can, it's still viable as long as it doesn't freeze. So if you freeze it, uh, you kill some of the microbes and these kind of things. Um, if it gets frozen, you might, it still could be viable, but maybe once it's frozen, it's going to only be good for that next season. Um, so if you're going to store it, let it dry out a little bit, but not completely. And then store in a non airtight container. So like, just leaving a five gallon bucket uh, with a lid halfway on, not completely uh, closed. And then storing in dry, cooler conditions are gonna be uh, the best for the longevity of your vermicompost. And let's look at some troubleshooting. 
So uh, if our bedding is too dry, we can simply add some moisture with a spray bottle to, to wet it down a little bit. Um, bedding is too wet, add more newspaper and peat moss. Um, again, if there's a drain, then that kind of helps solve that problem a little bit, and we can drain off, uh, collect vermity. And uh, if there's an odor, if it starts to smell bad, uh, it, it means that we probably have too much food in there and the worms aren't able to uh, process it quick enough, or there's something that they're not, you know, and this is kind of a, 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 a process of observation. Maybe there's something that these worms just aren't as into. So if, if there's something that they just don't go for, maybe we'll, maybe it's time to cross that off of their menu. Uh, mixing bedding. Uh, so uh, you need to mix in the bedding when, uh, over time, when, when we're adding food and these kind of things. So you can use a plastic fork to do that. But then topping, topping it off when uh, every, you know, at least six weeks is also going to be important. Um, keeping it covered. So with a, with a small, uh, a thin layer of bedding is gonna help produce, uh, you know, kind of white fly, well, uh, uh, um, uh, fruit flies, gnats, these kind of nasty little kitchen pests um, will help to uh, reduce that. Want to make sure we're keeping it between 55 and 85, probably a little bit warmer than 55 for, for optimum activity, probably closer to like 65 degrees, they're going to be more active. And uh, always, you know, making sure that the food is buried um, every couple of days or weekly, you know, again, they can process with a thing to keep in mind is for every thousand worms, that's about a pound and a half of food a day that they can go through. And let's look at some permacompost uses. So uh, it's great as a amendment for seedlings starting plants to mix in with our uh, seed starters, seed starting uh, medium, a supplemental fertilizer to mix in with our compost, mixing with peat and perlite and uh, or vermiculite as, to make our own uh, potting mixes for containers. And the ratio there is about um, one part vermicompost to four parts uh, our other material. So now in the garden, now, you know, we're using vermicompost. We're not getting tons and tons out of this system, right? But this is very concentrated fertilizer is the way to think about it. So we're really using it as like a side dress or even how you might use like a, uh, like a miracle grow. So uh, in the soil, we're you know just mixing in maybe 50% uh, uh, vermicompost with the soil around a plant that we've already planted in the garden, and then kind of mixing it into the soil and watering it in, or mixing in a little bit into the into the uh, hole when we when we install the plant, mixing mixing it into the soil that we're going to use to actually install that plant. And then I've mentioned vermicompost tea a few times. Uh, and this can be used as a liquid fertilizer, like you would use like a, an organic liquid miracle grow. And the rate there is a couple tablespoons of the vermicompost to one liter of water and let it stand for a day or two. And every, every you know, if you're walking by, maybe shake it up a little bit. And then in a couple of days, you'll have a really nice uh, vermicompost tea that you can also use as a fertilizer. So those are kind of the major uses here. And then uh, some further resources. I, I use uh, the Rodale Institute for a lot of organic vermicompost, permaculture kind of things. Um, but that says, I just realized that says uh, extension. So it's going to the wrong uh, 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 link, but that's okay. You can check out the Rodale Institute. Uh, all you do is just Google Rodale Institute and you'll, it'll take you there. And then this is one that's really neat and it's more for kids. Uh, but it's a really great uh, uh, resource on, on all kinds of information and tutorials on uh, vermicomposting. And that's the Adventures of Herman the Worm, pretty entertaining. And we saw the, the cartoon worm that was Herman the Worm. And then a really broad range, which I'll show you here. Uh, we have a nice resource that's basically a, a compilation of uh, resources from University of Wisconsin Extension. And this is probably the most uh, complete list of educational resources, 
uh, for you know uh, instructions and tutorials, uh, books, videos, trades, journals, and then resources here, vermicomposting supplies and sources. So if you're wondering where, do, where can I order worms uh, and you, you want to look outside of Amazon, I would check these out. And um, that pretty much wraps it up for vermicomposting. I'm sure that there's a few questions here, so we'll go ahead and do our best to answer your questions. And then there's my contact info. If if you have something that you'd like to uh, message me and ask me later, there's my contact info. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Austin. Um, and also, I will send out his contact information in an email too if you don't get a chance to write it down now. Um, okay. So we do have a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, let me find them. I clicked on the wrong Word document. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So first we have. Um, this person is from Urbana and they said is or they asked is there a local source for bins or a way to make your own um, and also the same person I think it was um, they said they had made one out of a plastic bin I think it was the same person I'm not sure but they put small holes in the sides and the top um, but they saw some mold growing in there um, does that mean that there's not enough airflow or is it normal so how to make a bin or where to purchase one Okay, yeah, where to purchase, you know, uh, for, for ready-made bins, you're going to be able to find those at, at a lot of garden centers and kind of even the even in some, I'm sure, big box stores, they're going to have some kind of uh, worm bins. But what we kind of talked about today was how to build your own. And, you know, uh, again, you can use as a as like a, a Tupperware tub, you know, like a 10-gallon tub. You can, um, you can certainly find uh, tutorials on how to make a, a few different types of systems. They, there are systems that get more complex where there's layered kind of systems, which again, I haven't used, um, but uh, in here would be some good resources to look into for that. But the real general, you know, basic uh, construction is going to be like we talked about, a, a container, a, a box type container. And something I said before was drilling holes on the bottom. I, I, and, and raising it there, that's the recommendation is raising it off the ground. I think that's in the outdoors so that it doesn't, uh, so that temperatures, you know, don't fluctuate or it doesn't freeze with ground contact maybe. But um, I'm thinking drilling holes in the bottom maybe is, I'm gonna take that one, edit that because I don't think that's the way to go. You wanna definitely keep holes drilled on the sides and the top though. And, um, I wouldn't be concerned with your worms escaping because they don't want to go outside into the light. So again, it's this self-limiting system. Um, so for, for that question, yeah, uh, I know that we just kind of looked at it very simply, but it is kind of that simple where you're drilling holes in the sides and the top. And, uh, you know, that's really the, that's really the basic construction. It's, it's, it's not more complicated than that unless you want it to be, there are ways to make it more complicated with, with different, uh, types of boxes, but the one we're talking about is just the most basic. Uh, as far as molds, I mean, it would depend on, it definitely depends on the kind of mold. Not all molds are going to be bad. Some are going to be bad. Um, but uh, generally, if, uh, you know, if they're worried about it, maybe when they go harvest, uh, go to harvest the river compost, just clean it out with a, uh, some kind of disinfectant, I think would be fine. And then make sure that that's rinsed out thoroughly so that Whatever, whatever cleaning supply is used, it's not going to uh, harm the worms. Uh, but uh, yeah, once, because you know, you, you eventually you will need to empty it. So at that time you can, you can clean it out. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't think mold on its own is necessarily bad unless it's like a black mold or something like that. But it might indicate that it's not getting enough air. Yeah, or that it's too wet. Okay. Um, okay. So the next question is uh, regular potting soil from the garden center is okay to use, correct? <laughs> if you're using it, it depends on how they're thinking about using it. Um, potting soil mixed into the bedding probably is not going to harm anything, but it's not going to have those microbes and uh, those microorganisms that you want to try to incorporate into your bedding. 
So, I mean, as far as a medium, just an inert medium, it's okay, but it's going to have things that they're not going to eat at all, like uh, uh, perlite. You know, they're not going to really consume perlite. That's a man-made uh, component or man-made material. And, uh, but the other part of soilless media is going to be, you know, hardwood, broken down bark and peat moss and these kind of things, which we've already recommended. But it's, it's just not, if they're, if they're wanting to try to inoculate it with generally not going to have that microbial uh, amount in there. And you should also be careful with those because they can have uh, synthetic uh, fertilizers in there, which uh, you want to avoid in your, um, in your bedding. So, so those kind of nitrates, you know, like ammonium um, could be harmful to the, uh, to the worms in there. So uh, I would say, you know, it, it, it's, it's probably not going to be too much of a problem, but you're going to be missing out on, on uh, the microbes. Now, if you're talking about using soilless media in potting mix to mix in with your vermicompost, absolutely. Yeah, your finished product um, is perfectly fine. Yeah, that's a great way to, to use that vermicompost. But, but putting it into the bedding mix, I'm not so sure um, if... Uh, it, you know, it, again, it's going to be okay as long as it doesn't have synthetic fertilizers already mixed in with it. Okay. So the next person has two questions. Um, the first question is, is it possible to have multiple worm breeds in a single bin, uh, like red wigglers and super red European nightcrawlers? Yeah. Yep. I mentioned that a couple times. And um, it, yeah, I would just do some research. I'm not... Uh, an expert on the worm species, but I know that there are systems where, yeah, where where you can have a, a, a couple of mixes and you maybe you're, you're wanting to have a species that's more of a deep, deeper burrowing and one that's more of a shallow burrowing to, to get more of a complete uh, uh, digestion and composting system going. Um, you know, it, it, it can work. They, and like I, like I mentioned, uh, you know, in, in certain conditions, some worms are gonna be more active. Like if it's a little warmer, one species may take over kind of and kind of outcompete the other one. Or uh, if it's cooler, the other one might take over like a night crawler might be more active in cooler conditions. So there's just those things to think about and, and, and maybe it's worth it, you know, maybe. Um, and, and as I said, it's, it can be more expensive to get multiple species than just the one, but um, you know, these things are all open to interpretation. So it's, uh, it's, it's definitely not something that is discouraged. It, it's, it's something that people definitely do. Uh, so yes, it, it can be done successfully. Okay. Uh, the next question that they had actually, um, about two other people had this same question and it was what to do with your bins uh, during the winter months, especially their outdoor bins um, to keep them from you know, freezing or, or kind of what, how do you handle them? Right. So worms, they, if they, if they freeze, if they get down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, they're going to die uh, because their bodies will freeze. So what they do to avoid that is they just go deeper into the soil to where the soil isn't, isn't to that temperature because soil holds on to uh, heat the deeper in the soil you go almost, you know, over winter. Uh, now the eggs can overwinter in the, in the uh, frozen parts of the soil. They, that's how they, that's one way of overwintering and survival of our, of our worm species in North America is the, wor is the, is the, the, the eggs overwinter and they emerge in the spring. Uh, but uh, if you don't take them in, and maybe that's another part of keeping them off the ground, they're gonna, it's gonna freeze and it'll probably kill all your adults. So I guess the only way to avoid that would be moving them in uh, to, to keep them, you know, maybe even moving them into a garage or something and keeping, keeping them off the ground is important because even in a garage, uh, when you have that uh, transfer of, of heat from the box to the ground, it's still going to freeze. So keeping it above ground, maybe in a room that's no cold, no colder than like 50 degrees, uh, is going to be the thing to do. So yeah, if, if they're outside, you are going to have to think about what to do with them during the winter. So obviously, if you got them indoors, uh, that's not such an issue. Um, 
but yeah, if you if you want to keep the adults uh, keep the colony, then then yeah, you have to make sure that they don't get uh, they don't freeze somehow. Okay, um, and we did have a question about um, if the bin does a bin smell under normal conditions. No, it shouldn't, and that's a con that's a common concern. But no, in general, it shouldn't. And if it does, that means that uh, it's an indicator. Actually, it's a helpful indicator that there's too much food in the system. And it's too much. It's more than what uh, the worms can quickly, uh, you know, devour. Now, if it's, you know, we, we can put decomposing rotting produce in there, but the question is, did it smell before it went in there? You know, it's still, it's just because it's in the system doesn't mean it's not going to have an odor. But in general, uh, the worm should be processing the the uh, the food in there, and uh, no, it it shouldn't. But if it does, it it probably just means that there's too much food in the system, and it's just it's uh, maybe rotting uh, with anaerobic uh, conditions, you know. So if 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 you get anaerobic conditions, that's that's really bad. So we want to try to keep an eye on it. So if it smells bad, it, it means we need to take some things out, probably. And probably it's maybe too wet. Okay. Um, and I think you did hit on this at the end with your links, but the recommended sources for the worms. Yeah. Well, you know, you can get anything on Amazon. You can get red <laughs> on Amazon for $50. But if you want to look at some other sources, these are what I would, this is where I would start on this, um, on this uh, list here. And this is a link that's in uh that's on one of the, pa the the last pages here on my resources. So this is yeah a really great uh, resource here. And and personally, I haven't I haven't purchased them when I worked at uh, the uh, the Vermicompost Center. They had already had that all set up. We used red red wigglers there if that's any help. But um, yeah, I would just these are what they recommend, and I would kind of look at these. Um, maybe there's a source in Illinois, but these are generally you know, um, these are, yeah, all over the country, but that's what I would recommend is just get them shipped. Uh, and, and looking here, they're saying, uh, 20 bucks a pound just at the, uh, at the first one we're looking at here in Wisconsin. So, Hey, you know, uh, if, if you're looking for, uh, uh, affordability, this is a good list here. Okay. And we will send out, I'll get those links and we'll send them out, um, in an email mm -hmm. just in case. Um, so, okay, also, next question, um, when adding bedding, do we have to add more soil, too? It's not going to hurt, uh, a, a handful or two. Yeah, that's not going to hurt. Um, okay. it's, it's, you know, make sure that it's clean soil and, and uh, you know, uh, dry. You want it to, so, so that you can, well, generally dry enough that you can mix it in. But uh, yeah, the idea of that soil is that it's going to have those microbes that the worms use to digest. But yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. Okay, so the next question is, uh, my worms travel down to the bottom of the bin and manage to crawl through the material in the bottom. Why do they do this and how do I stop them? <laughs> yeah, and I kind of kind of brushed on, on that topic. Um, you know, it's with... Uh, you probably don't have holes. I mean, I guess if it's if it's a race kind of system, having holes in the bottom is going to be okay, but um, you're going to lose any kind of vermity that you might have down there. And as far as them escaping, I'm not sure. I, I, I'd have to look more into that, why, why that would happen, because the, the idea is that they're in this environment, this kind of ideal environment where they've got, they've got uh, cover, protection, from the bedding, so it's a it's a dark environment. It's aerated, you know. It's moist. It's the right temperature, and they've got their food source there. So why would they venture out into the into the light where they don't want to be? You know, that's kind of so. It's it's counterintuitive, and and I I don't have a good answer right off the bat. Um, you know, I I don't know. I, if they want to uh, if they want to email me, I could look more into that and give them, you know, maybe, maybe it's, it was the bedding type or something. There, there must've been something in the system they didn't like, but what that would be, I don't know, but uh, I'd be willing to, I definitely would be happy to look into it. And uh, if they want to email me, I can give more info on it. Okay. 
Um, the next question is, um, are red wigglers from the bait shop okay? As long as they're red wigglers, sure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, if it's that species, it, I don't think it matters really where you get it from. Okay. So, okay. What is the purpose of not feeding the worms for two weeks when you migrate to a new bin? Um, I currently use a two-tier system and put food on the top bin to draw the worms up and harvest the gold left in the lower bin. Yeah, and so that's kind of those, those multi-bin system, bin systems. The idea with kind of just having one open space that they're in is it gives them time to uh, completely digest and compost everything. So, so it just kind of makes a more complete product. Uh, it gives them some time to go ahead and, so, and, and uh, 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 seek out the, the leftover stuff that maybe hasn't been processed yet. So that's, that's the idea with, with uh, stopping feeding for a couple of weeks. Just okay. Give it time to condition, basically, and, and make sure that they, they complete their, their feeding. Okay. Um, and this question, I think, was actually asked when you were explaining the very first question that we asked about making your own bins and stuff. They asked, mm -hmm. why can't um, the would-be cedar? Right. So, yeah, cedar and some other kind of uh, evergreen woods. Uh, so, uh, soft wood is, is, is that type of wood. And cedar particularly has uh, antimicrobial chemicals that it, that it uh, releases. So that's absorbed into the bedding material and uh, that's going to kill off some of our microbes and bacteria that, that the worms use to digest uh, their food and turn, turn that into vermicompost. So um, yeah, that's, that's the main reason why and kind of the same thing uh, with uh, using cedar mulch around some, some kind of uh, landscape plants is, is that, uh, that antimicrobial activity. So, you know, there's there's uh, some kind of conventional wisdom that they that it deters termites and that kind of thing, but um, we're not trying to deter termites here. So um, yeah, that's that's the main reason why cedar is uh, recommended. It's recommended to use like a hardwood, you know, some kind of hardwood like uh, oak or maple or you know poplar or something like that. Okay. Okay, what is a safe cleaner for the bin? Well, any kind of cleaner is going to be fine as long as you rinse it out. I mean, you know, bleach or um, even like a dish detergent, um, you know, spick and span kind of kind of any any kind of cleaner like that. Uh, you just got to make sure you you you, you uh, clean it, wash it out, make sure that it's, you know once you've used it, you, you clean it out because. Yeah, those those kind of uh, chemicals can be harmful to uh, organisms, you know, living things. So I, I don't think it matters quite so much what uh, what it is. It's just you got to make sure it's cleaned out. And I would probably say that leaving it out in the sun, if it's a nice sunny day. Hey, yeah, that too. <laughs> you know, yeah, after you nice rinse it. Sunny. Yep, yep, let it dry out and rinse it out, yep. Um, okay, so the next question, um, is vermi wash and vermi tea the same thing? Vermi wash. Yeah, I think that's just another, probably just another word for vermi tea. And there's products out there that, that have uh, maybe some other fertilizers in it with the vermicompost. Like you might find something that's got, that's like a fish emulsion, right? Like a liquid fish emulsion fertilizer and it's got uh, some other beneficial bacteria and enzymes, but it's also got that vermicompost tea in it. So yeah, verma wash is probably, as far as I know, would be the same thing as vermi, vermi tea. Okay. Um, and the last question, um, you, you hit on in the beginning, there was a question asked about this, but just in case they missed it, uh, they live in a city and they don't have access to soil. They don't have a yard. Um, if they were going to purchase a soil mix, um, what were they looking for? Just a quick review on that again. For a soil mix, Okay, and again, I, I, I don't know if they mean for, uh, for using in a potting mix or for mixing in with their... their Just to start their worms. Oh, to mix it in? Right, to mix yeah. it in? Yeah. 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 Um, then you can, yeah, okay. So again, yeah, I kind of, we, we talked about this one and my thought on it is a soilless mix that you're going to get 
like a miracle Grow soil mix is going to have, uh, it's going to probably contain some synthetic fertilizers in there and, and things like perlite, which is like a, uh, superheated, uh, a clay mineral that's like puffed up and worms aren't going to eat that. Uh, now as an inert material in the compost, yeah, it's, or in the vermicompost, that's fine. My only concern with like, like a, a, a soilless medium or media that has synthetic fertilizers in there is that it, it, uh, it could be, you know, um, it could throw things off in, in the, uh, in the system. It could make them, it could, it could harm the worms, you know, it could, uh, it could make the bacteria that they, that they use to, to, uh, to, uh, digest their food in their guts. It could, it could, uh, slow them down. It could, uh, make them consume that. And then, and then they won't be, uh, can, you know, part of the a system where they're consuming food and the worms are consuming them in the food, you know, so it can, those synthetic fertilizers, I just think could uh, throw the thing off. And, and, you know, one of the ideas of vermicompost is that it's an organic fertilizer. So we'd be kind of mitigating some of the benefits we get from this organic natural system of creating fertility and nutrient availability with these synthetic fertilizers. So with that being said, I think it's fine, but you'd still need to get some, some kind of soil that has uh, microbes in it because that, that, uh, that uh, man-made, you know, synthetically produced soilless medium is, uh, is not going to have the microbe population that you're wanting. So what you can do is, uh, you know, at, at the garden store, they also sell topsoil. So you can buy a bag of topsoil and that's going to have some of those microbes in it. Maybe not as much as, as what you get from a backyard if you go grab a handful, but it'll have some. And uh, maybe, maybe I'd also just look for compost. See, that would be the good alternative. If you can buy a bag of compost, uh, that would be what I would recommend on, on over all of those would be compost instead. Okay. Um, and we do actually have one more question that came in. And I believe this has to do with how many worms you actually have. But um, they asked, will they eat one to one and a half pounds or half to one pound of scraps? The general guideline that, that I've seen in, in, most, uh, in, in most sources is uh, a pound to a pound and a half per 1,000 worms per day. That's about the rate. I mean, that's going to fluctuate depending on, you know, many conditions, but the general, uh, general uh, uh, rate is uh, one pound of worms consume about a pound and a half of, of uh, food a day. All right. Okay, and that is the last question that I have. Thank you, Austin, um, again, for presenting on this topic. It was very, a lot of people were very interested in it. Great. Thank you. Yeah, as I said, you know, it's, I mean, relative to me, I, I, I've only known about it for about, I guess, seven years, and uh, I'm learning about it as I go as well. So it's an interesting topic to me, too. All right. Um, just a few while people are still on here. Uh, I will be sending an email with Austin's contact information and a, all the links that he provided. This program will be uploaded to our YouTube page and I'll send you a link for that. Also, uh, look for in the future, maybe a month from now, we are going to, uh, Austin is going to be doing a program on uh, possibly building healthy soils and kind of pulling these composting and vermicomposting things into practical use and also with cover crops and, uh, you know, things like that. So just uh, look for that on our website. And thank you all very much for joining us. Hey, thank you, Maggie. And, and thanks, everybody, for joining today. Have a good Friday.